Lean is great, process control is great, uh, you know, P-themas are wonderful, but process is not a substitution for capable human beings. Just a quick reminder for you to like, subscribe, and rate this podcast so we can get your feedback and know how to make it better. Hey, it's Ari. Welcome to another episode of the Made in America podcast. I'm really excited to have Jason Jarvis on, president of Jarvis Airfoil. Jason, thanks so much for coming on today. My pleasure. Well, listen, Jay, it's the Made in America podcast, so we always start off with the same two questions. What do you make and why do you make it? Well, Jarvis Airfoil makes uh, compressor airfoils. So airfoils are little bent pieces of metal in a jet engine that uh, compress the air. So um, they come in all shapes and sizes, uh, a variety of derivatives, different alloys. Um, and we make them for large engine manufacturers. So mostly Pratt & Whitney and General Electric. But in the past, we've made parts for MTU, Rolls-Royce, uh, Snecma, and uh, you have it. So. Um, We've been making these types of parts uh, uh, for a very long time at Jarvis. Um, uh, and I, I guess to answer the why we make them, um, it, at this point, it, it, it's a, a, probably mostly about momentum, to be honest. Uh, we started uh, producing uh, airfoils for General Electric back in the 40s. So and during the war, um, there was a, a gentleman in the UK named uh, Sir Frank Whittle who had come up with a, with a centripetal compressor, basically a jet engine that was a large turbocharger, a large turbo pump. And uh, at that time, the United Kingdom was unable to sort of industrialize on that bit of tech, that idea, to make it work because they were getting regularly bombed well, by the yeah. Germans and and life was difficult. Uh, but in Lynn, Mass, there was a little company called General, General Electric that was making a very similar uh, machine, uh, a, a large turbocharger that they were hanging on the side of prop-driven piston uh, engines that uh, were flying. And the, the point of these turbochargers that GE was making was that they would compress the air, compress the, the, the gas going into the, the piston engines so that they could fly at higher altitudes. Mm -hmm. So the problem with piston engines is you get up to a certain altitude, you know, you don't have the density of air, you're not getting the compression, you're not getting, you know, all the goodness you would get in the combustion chamber. So they have these big turbochargers that they're making. Frank Whittle comes along with his device, which he uh, uh, could, has proven you can fly a jet with. GE takes that and has the industrial capability to uh, produce it and to begin iterating on the whole idea. So there were some uh, genius predecessors to the individuals who worked at NASA that uh, worked for an organization called the NACA. And they had come up with all these uh, airfoil profiles. And they had this concept uh, for axial flow compression. So instead of one big fan, one big turbo pump, you'd have different stages where you'd have a, a rotary stage and, and a stator stage that uh, by working together would uh, serve to compress the gases in an engine. So. Uh, a, a gas turbine engine, a jet engine. Yeah, I was going to say. So, yeah, all right. So let's, let's, let's we're going to zoom way out. Yeah, 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 exactly. Let's zoom way out. And we're going to zoom way out. Give a very small education on how an engine yeah, And please, anytime I'm drilling into specifics <laughs> or technical, Love just, no, no. just uh, give will. me a look. You got it. I and got I'll, you. I'll, I'll, I'll zoom way out. So... So in, in, in a, you know, in a jet engine, when, when you're going to uh, you know, jump on a flight somewhere, you, you're walking down the gangplank and you look at that engine and you see um, you know, a big nacelle and a big fan. So you see all those fan blades yeah, so in the front sure of the engine. Gets that. Before we get, but yeah. One second. Let's, before we get to jet engine, let's just start with sort of like a propeller plane, right? Okay. So a propeller plane just sort of works, right, by you've got enough wingspan and you can push enough air underneath it that it's going to keep the plane up. Right. So you have, so, uh, right, in, in a prop-driven plane, you have uh, several airfoils working to fly this thing, right? Your wings yep. are airfoils, Yep. right? Uh, and your uh, propellers, uh, all those surfaces are basically airfoil surfaces. And what an airfoil does is uh, on, on one side you have suction, on the other side you have pressure. So it creates a lifting surface. So that particular shape, when you move it through air, it lifts. All right. So you have to figure out how to move it through air quickly. But yeah. uh, on a prop driven plane, um, you know, again, the prop is dragging those wings forward and the wings are generating lift, but also the prop is generating lift, et cetera. Okay. So when you get so into a jet engine, there we go. Okay. You basically have 
several props in a row contained within that engine. Right. And when you get on that jet and you look at that uh, engine, what you're seeing is the very first stage, and that's called the fan. So the fan is sucking all the air in, all right? Big, you know, on a, on a G90, it's 112 inches. You know, you can stand in the nacelle, which is the nose cone don't recommend of the jet it. engine. Don't, I don't recommend it while it's running. There are videos of that, and it's horrible on naval carriers. Um, and then behind that, you have a variety of stages that uh, serve to compress those gases to a very dense stream, and that's the compressor. And these are all different rows of parts called blades and veins. Blades rotate around the center line of the engine. Uh, uh, veins are static. Um, and then you add a little fuel to this very dense gas. It goes boom, and then it flushes out the back end of the engine, which is the turbine section of the engine, and the turbine drives a shaft very simplistically speaking, which drives the fan. So you have the fan, which is sucking the air in, all right? You have the compressor, which is squeezing it. You have the compressor, which is adding fuel, bang, and then out the turbine section, uh, you're blowing those hot gases. So if you can remember suck, squeeze, bang, blow, you will remember exactly how an engine, how, works. How an engine works. Yes, there you yes, go. Suck, there you squeeze, go. bang, blow. I think no one can forget that, that, right? No one can forget that. Yes. So, <laughs> so the idea is the big, the big important process there is when you have a jet, you can fly h higher and faster. Y yeah. I mean, uh, uh, sort of strength to weight ratio of a, of a gas turbine to a, a, any other device is, is absolutely ridiculous. I mean, the amount of thrust that's generated by these, uh, by these turbine engines is, is spectacular. Right. I mean, you see on the on the F thirty five, you've got one engine and and the thing it's a it's a bonkers fifth generation fighter that's got no peer. Right. So you put two of them on on an aircraft and you've got the Raptor and that's even a little crazier. Right. But but I mean, you look at you know I mean you look at a seven seven seven. You got two G ninety engines hanging off of it and what four hundred passenger. I mean the you know it's an enormous amount of energy uh, uh, created by these little machines and it's. It, 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 they're just absolute engineering marvels, and um, and you know it follows that um, we would be working to um, very specific designs with extremely tight tolerances, where every part of your process, from where you get the material, from how that material's processed, how that material's cut, how. Um, you know, how that part is inspected, how that part is post-processed is very closely managed uh, relative to the engineering requirements that had been thought about and discussed and argued over years and years and years and laid out. Yeah, which is in part, right, because you need to have this the precision to get the end result that you want, the output, and you also need the reliability so we don't have planes falling from the sky every which way. Yeah. I, I mean, in our space, if if one part unzips, you basically destroy everything downstream of where your part released uh, in the engine. So I mean, because you, you think about all these fans. down for a second because that's a... I mean, it's an important point. I, listen, it's actually super interesting, and I, I hope the audience is going to find it interesting. I, I don't know that, you know, maybe in the, you know, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, when sort of, you know, jets were becoming more commonplace and passenger travel, maybe people thought a lot more about, wow, this is amazing. How does it work? And and so on. But now in, in 2022, air travel is so ubiquitous. And I think so, you know, you, you think about getting on a plane the same way on riding a bus or a train or a bicycle. I think we lost some sight of exactly how High tech, precision, and amazing these products are. So let's get into it. And the field experience that yeah. the engineers have and the designers have uh, in terms of knowing what works and, and what doesn't work and, and iterating on those experiences and those designs over and over and over again to, to build in reliability first and then to build in performance and then to build in lightness when you're talking about uh, military engines. Uh, it, 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 so it's not just in, in our world, it's not just. Um, 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 you know, geometric tolerances. It's not just, you know, obviously hitting a, a shape within the tolerances is very important. Literally, every part of what we do is guided by rules and fixed into a process that is approved by our supplier. So when we buy material, we have to buy material. Say we're going to buy material for a Pratt & Whitney job. It is to a uh, special um, set of instructions uh, that Pratt & Whitney laid out, tested, validated 30 years ago. 
So instead of buying Thai 64, we buy PWA 1228. And you have to buy PWA 1228 from only a few suppliers, and it has to be tested. So chemistry and tensils, just to make sure that it meets all the requirements of PWA 1228. Yeah, we're but, just not picking up metal off the off the street somewhere. Nope. And, and then you, a Home Depot run. Right. And then you, you take that piece of metal, you know, that rod, and you go to a forging supplier. And that forging supplier's process has to be approved by a forging expert at your customer. And they validate that forging process through metal allergy and chemistry, et cetera, et cetera. And then, and, and it just follows. So absolutely everything we're doing uh, is, is to a set of instructions that have been laid out uh, that are audited and fixed and, and, and validated regularly. So, so in the engine, you talked about from the, you're saying sort of if one of the, one of the pieces of the airflow <laughs> unzips in the beginning, yeah. it's going to tear through the engine. So which part of the, of the, uh, uh, you know, of the process is the airfoil component on the engine. Is it the fans in the front? Well, is there it... are airfoils throughout the engine. Mm -hmm. So the, the fan is a big airfoil. All the compressor blades and vanes are airfoils. Um, and then on the turbine section, there are turbine airfoils. So they just have different jobs in the engine. So they have different engineering requirements. Uh, you know, the fan needs to be light but strong. It's going to flutter a lot. So it has to have a lot of fatigue capability. Mm -hmm. Uh, in the compressor, it's the same thing. Uh, in the in the front of the compressor, the temps are not so great, so you you want something that uh, does its job, but also can flutter and and not fatigue. So fatigue capability is how long can something flutter before it uh, a crack propagates and mm. something unzips. So you want to make sure that you have a part that you're designing and that you're uh, doing everything you can in your manufacturing process to ensure that you're not creating stress risers that might propagate a crack. So when they first had um, uh, aircraft, uh, passenger aircraft uh, that were flying, they had square windows with sharp corners. Uh, but they, uh, uh, when they were overhauling and looking at these uh, aircraft on the ground, they noticed that there were little cracks coming off of those square corners because those sharp corners are stress risers. So the stresses at that sharp corners are, are so great that it begins to unzip. So, uh, so now you see oval. Every window windows is, yeah, everywhere. That's right. That's right. And do you know what they do when they find a crack in an airframe? I don't. They drill a little circular hole at the end of it. Is that right? Yeah, to dissipate the stresses along that radial surface. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Yeah. So it's it's um, you, you know it it it's a very particular niche that we're in. And you guys so are getting all the, when when you, we talk about Jarvis airfoil. You guys are doing all those different types of airfoils all throughout the engine? Yeah. So we have so mostly compressor airfoils, but we have uh, done some fan blades, smaller fan blades. So, so we have a machining box based on the size of equipment that we have in the shop. So, you know, we're, we're on the smaller uh, size. And then turbine airfoils are mostly castings. And the castings, uh, you can't... Uh, you know, we're not milling castings. You would have to grind castings because of the hardness. Um, and uh, that, that tends to be specialty equipment as well. Somebody else's gig. Yeah, I mean, we, we have some grinding machines in the shop, and we've done a few turbine jobs, turbine part jobs. But it, it is another niche that's uh, very specific. So, I mean, so that, listen, thank you for the jet engine uh, class. So hopefully people got a lot of that. And I want to definitely circle back to Jarvis and, and what you guys are doing um, but with all that, you sound like you've been an, an engine engineer for your whole life, but that really hasn't been uh, so no. much the case. So let's talk about how Jason ended up at uh, Jarvis Airfoil. I'm a very good mimic. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm very good at uh, processing information and, and asking a lot of questions. So I, I yeah, I mean, I started, uh, I started my uh, thinking about what I wanted to do when I was in high school, and I wanted to be a, a political reporter. So um, I was very interested in politics and journalism. My mother was a journalist. She had uh, worked for the Boston Globe and, and written uh, for a variety of different uh, magazines. And we uh, lived in New Hampshire at that time. So she uh, was very interested in presidential and electoral politics. And I was interested. So, you know, she used to drag me around all these different uh, events and meetings and fundraisers and things like that. And, and you know, I, I guess I kind of 
caught the bug. So, um, so I, you know, wrote for my uh, school papers through high school and, and college. And when I graduated from college, I went to Washington, D.C. and worked for a news briefing called The Hotline, which was a, a, a digest of electoral politics. And, uh, you know, I worked there for four years. And, um, uh, and then my mother was looking. At that time, my mother had... Um, uh, she used to have a television show in Boston called Point of View, um, WLVI, but they fired her because she got a little old, and she got a gig. Is that right? Yeah, they hired a younger woman. Uh oh. <laughs> so she she won an Emmy. Nineteen eighty seven or something. She had where been that was... killing it. She knew all the Paul. She had uh, done that gig for I don't know a decade or more. Um, so my, my memories as a child would be my mom leaving on Sunday night and coming back on Friday, yeah. you know, and she had this life where she was, you know, a, 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 a sort of a, a mini celebrity in Boston, uh, with this talk show. Yeah. So, for those of you uh, who want to Google that Judy Jarvis, you can, uh, yep. still get some There's of those old clips out there. Still some good stuff out there. there is yeah. Indeed. She was a force of nature. So she, uh, she left her TV gig, um, and then uh, landed um, a radio gig on the Cape, working for a guy named Ernie Bach. And so he had a 50,000-watt uh, talk radio um, uh, station out there. So she Is that a lot? 50,000 watts? Yeah, 50,000 watts to like WTIC. That's a monster. It's a monster. Yeah, okay. yeah it's, it's, it's sounded a, like a lot. Yeah, that's a... It's a big. That's a that, big. That's about as big as it gets. Gotcha. So, um, so she was doing a, a noon to three gig counter-programmed against Rush and... Um, and um, but she was on Cape Cod, and uh, WPOP used to have Rush, and Rush moved to WTIC, and my dad said, "You know what, honey? Maybe it's time you move home." <laughs> 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 so she did. She got a she got a gig at uh, WPOP with a noon to three slot uh, opposite Rush. And uh, you know, again, you you did a little bit of homework. She's an exceptionally charismatic uh, woman who just would stick her foot in any door and and be be in there drinking champagne with them within fourteen minutes. And she uh, was really tremendous. I, I got it. I mean, I, I, uh, I told yeah. this before. I did, I happened to I did some googling myself, and I caught a a C span sort of a three way debate style uh, interview thing. And uh, yeah, she she's a pistol. knew, knew her stuff and. Gave no ground. It was no great. joke. Yeah, she was no joke. And and you know her arc is interesting as well because when she was coming up and wanting to write about electoral politics, there were no women. She you know she'd go into the newsroom at the Boston Globe and say, you know, I've got this piece. I was up in Manchester and I was talking to some of these folks, and you know, I've got some information. And you know, they would say, yeah, well, the you know the home act department is <laughs> over there. You know, if you want to write about recipes or uh, you know advice, you know, go go that way. So she really was sort of on the on the cutting edge of that, and and um, to her and uh, you know another number of other women in the business, you know everything's changed. I mean everything's changed in the world, uh, which is wonderful. But it it was a struggle for her because she was always kind of managing that work and home and kid and sort of stuff, and you know probably failing regularly, but still <laughs> working all? on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. doesn't everybody? Exactly. So uh, she got this gig at WPOP. Uh, they actually ended up syndicating the show, so uh, the show would go up uh, on satellite, and and um, you know little stations around the country would download it, and she would go uh, to these uh, NAB conferences, the National Association of Broadcasters conventions, and she would sell the show to these little groups. So there would be someone who owns a car dealership and four radio stations in St. Louis, and someone who owns a you know a Domino's chain in San Diego and has five stations, you know, and so there are all these little groups, and she got a pretty good. Um, um, uh, group of stations together, you know, I don't know, 60, something like that. That's a big deal, by the way. I just yeah. take a quick minute. I, you know, I, I don't know many people have any idea about broadcasting and, and know anything about radio, but the idea of syndicating a show where you, you have a show and then you get other stations to essentially, to your point, buy the show. So that instead of having their own show, they just pay you and they release your show and they use that to generate their ad revenue and, and interest. That 60, so you, 60 you, station syndication is pretty impressive. Right. We would, we would give them the show. But oh. but we would take their cum, their average quarterly hour numbers, um, and we would add that to our aggregate cum and sell ads on the national side. So in any given hour, you got a clock, right? Yep. So uh, a piece of that pie is for local spots, and a piece of that pie is for national spots. Oh. So if you're going to listen to a radio show, there's you're going to hear your local 
Ford dealership. Yeah, yeah. But then you're going to hear, I don't know, you know, whatever yeah. ad, which is a national ad. So that's how the uh, uh, the syndicator is making their cash is on all those national ads. National ads. Does yep. the local station get a piece of the national ads? No, no. So you you basically are trading time. You're saying, you know, we're going to give you our programming. So you get content and you get seven minutes in the hour. Uh, we get four minutes in that hour. So, it. you know, that 11 minutes will be ads in that hour and the rest of it will be content. It's pretty so, cool. yep. So you're, you know, you, you, you set your clock. Everybody knows. So, you know, you're on radio time. You're sitting there looking at that big clock and you had to connect to ABC, you go up on the satellite. Everybody's got you. They're bringing you down and, and you. You just hit that clock for three hours a day. How is it that you know so much about the uh, radio show? About the radio show? Yeah, and the whole syndication. Good. Because we were syndicated. Yeah, and you were, but I, this was your mom, but you were executive producer. Uh, yes, well, I was executive producer, and, and then, yeah, and then, well, my mom passed away, and I, I hosted the show for a while, which was a terrible mistake, but <laughs> it was, was not my thing. But again, momentum seems to play a large role in my life. In your life. Yes, yeah. So yeah. mom's back on the show. That thing's going. You're, you're EP in the show. Yeah, so I'm I I I moved from Washington D.C. to Connecticut. I'm executive producing the show. We're at WPOP in Newington, and um, um, we you know we go to one of these conventions in in uh, Seattle. She doesn't feel well. It turns out that she has uh, lung cancer, which is stage four. Uh, terrible, tragic thing. Um, uh, she you know kind of comes back from the initial. Um, I don't know. There she had some bad health stuff initially that was not great. So she sort of managed that and started managing the cancer, was able to come back on the show. Um, but it was 18 months of sort of challenges. So she had two strokes. Um, she lost a, a leg. <laughs> but she, you know, she battled through everything uh, and kept coming on the show. And it was one of those things where y y for her, uh, what she did was her. It was the sort of energy that, you know, encouraged her to get up every day. Yeah. So, um, but um, towards the very end, she had a second stroke, made it very difficult for her to talk. Um, and that was kind of it for her. So at that point, uh, you know, we had um, a stable of, of radio stations. My mother was interested in having me take over. Um, I was interested in taking over. The radio stations were fine having me. So I took over for a while. And um, and amongst all this personal side of the story, um, there had been a, a deregulation of the telecommunications industry. So, um, and I'm not saying that this is the ultimate cause of my demise, but this was a contributing factor. <laughs> So whereas uh, there used to be uh, controls on how many radio stations, newspapers, and television uh, stations you could own, I guess there had been an interest at some point in trying to keep propagandists with deep pockets away from having too much control over what was being said in the country. Seems like a good idea. Seems but like a good idea, right? You could try uh, it the other way, too, I guess. And someone said, you know, that's anti, you know, American or, you know, it's, it's, it goes against the free market. So so that sort of went out the window. And uh, large radio concerns with lots of um, with lots of money ended up buying, you know, huge numbers of radio stations. And then they would just have in-house talent. So instead of selling... At you know three hour clock, they sell twenty four hours. They go to a radio station. You want to be with Infinity? Guess what? We got twenty four hours of programming for you. Maybe you can take an hour and do a local show if you want. But we're gonna. It's gonna be sort of a a, a plug and play operation. So in that environment, it became exceptionally challenging to keep our stations away from that sort of attractive group because they're you know famous names and you know and and easy to deal with uh, in terms of just turning on you know, so do infinity. You don't do anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You just sell your local ads. Um, uh, so it, it became challenging. Uh, we started losing some stations and, and you know, I saw the writing on the wall. And, you know, the whole time there was always um, um, a manufacturing business, you know, that I worked at during the summers. And, and um, um, so with a, a Brief little um, intermission, um, I ended up um, uh, coming to work for my father about 17 years ago uh, in Portland. So I started, uh, you know, I started in purchasing and, and then just sort of uh, uh, worked my way up. Um, and my dad retired in 2015. So since 2015, I've been uh, president of Jarvis Airfoil and running it. So 
And so the and so your dad didn't found it. The company was like 1956. Is that right? No, he didn't. So the the I'm the fifth generation into a Jarvis manufacturing business. The airfoil business was um, um, founded by my grandfather. Grandfather, and possibly great grandfather. <laughs> okay, one of <laughs> but those two. It, guys. In the 40s, when we were doing some polishing work, that would have been great grandfather. But by the time we actually incorporated in '56 in in Portland, that was grandfather. So, so, but you said fifth generation, so that would be so great, 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 great. So my great, great um, used to work for the Brainerd family at the at the Portland uh, quarries. Brainerd Airport people, like the Brainerd Airport name, Brainerd, like. Like Brainerd, like Aetna, like, uh, yeah, like the brownstone quarries. Like yeah. The, yeah, so um, a, a big name in Connecticut. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, I uh, live on a Brainerd Road even. So. There, there you go. So um, so they used to own uh, brownstone quarries, I, I, I guess, amongst other things. But so um, uh, my great great was a... Um, was a controller, like a financial guy, a VP, a uh, CFO uh, for the Portland uh, quarry and um, got out of it at a certain point around the turn of the century, bought a, a little company that was making knit picks and, uh, and nutcrackers. So a couple machine tools uh, up in Hartford, a little shop. Yeah. Floats, this is the story, floated the equipment down the Connecticut River to Gildersleeve, <laughs> which is a little section of Portland, set up a shop. Uh, and then a couple years later, they moved into a facility in uh, Middletown, and they were making deburring tools. So little files and rasps and things for removing metal of different shapes and profiles. Because, you know, manufacturing used to be a process of making things that would almost fit together. And then you'd <laughs> remove a little material here or there, you know, and then it would fit together. Correct. So uh, think it's of not like, the way it like works uh, now. For people that don't know, it's almost like a nail file, right? You're like, yeah, file a little bit here, a little bit there until it sort of fits in. Yeah. Right. I mean, way back when every component of an assembly, like if you have a bunch of pieces of anything, it's an assembly, right? right. You know, the assembly of these glasses is this frame and that frame and this bin, right. you know, so you have a list of it. But way back, uh, everything was custom made. Cool. You know, you'd make it all custom. Then they would, uh, once they learned how to measure things. <laughs> so there's a really great book about precision that talks about. So the progression was we first learned how to measure precisely. Right. And then once you're able to measure precisely, then you can start to manufacture precisely, right? So then you can get your tolerance stack ups and you can start working on, on, on assemblies. And of course, the ultimate, one of the ultimate assemblies would be a jet engine or right, a nuclear right. reactor or something like that. Yes. Um, but um, so in that middle ground, there was still, you know, requirements for removing lots of metal uh, in different ways. Right. So we made these files and we had all these hand polishing people who uh, would work on different parts of making these files, you know, deburring them. Um, when you machine anything, sometimes you leave a burr yep. of metal where you don't want it. So you remove that burr. It's called deburring or, yep. or polishing. So we had a lot of people with very capable hands, I would say. And we're making these uh, rotary files and burrs for uh, GE Lynn, getting back to Frank Whittle. So in the 40s, when they are starting to machine airfoils, all right, we are selling them rotary files. And somehow, some way, uh, one of their salespeople said, you guys know how to hand polish and to burr. We have all these airfoils that we've roughly milled, and they have to fit into this particular shape. Can you, can you help us get these milling marks off? And we said, yeah, we can do that. <laughs> We know how to do that. So we started polishing airfoils for GE, for the River Works. That was what the factory was called in Lynn. And uh, at a certain point in time, we said, well, geez, you know, we could probably machine these too. So right. Bought some equipment and started machining them. And um, it got to a certain point with a certain amount of momentum that in 1956, we, we uh, built uh, the original structure in Portland and incorporated as Jarvis Airfoil. So... And then, the and then it just kind of, it's gone along uh, at, at different levels. So we've been kind of a prototyping house and a development house. We've been a production house um, and, and in between. Uh, it, so for it, those who don't know, what's the difference between a prototype? Uh, okay, so it would be um, um, high mix, low volume versus high volume, low mix. So in a prototyping environment, you have a, a large mix of part numbers that you're working on with very low volumes. Uh, in a production environment, you have a smaller mix of parts with, with very high volume. So you want to be in a, in, a, in a high volume, low mix environment in manufacturing because it allows you to tailor your processes and your equipment to 
you know, to get the most margin out of your out of your yeah, optimize your, right. right. If I shave, if I shave five percent right. off a process, I only ever do once. Right, but you want really the process to be complex. You don't want to be making you know washers or or or, or paper clips because those <laughs> are highly commoditized and you know they can make them just about anywhere. Yep. So if you're in a in an environment where things are complex, uh, it's a little bit better. You know, obviously there are a tremendous number of challenges. I mean, on any given airfoil, we've got four to 500 features that we check on every single part. If one of those features is out by an eighth of the diameter of one of your hairs, that's a non-conforming piece of hardware. So we either, you know, don't sell it, scrap it, rework oh. it. Oh. So, <laughs> so we regularly uh, are, uh, yeah, yeah, we're regularly sort of working through issues and, you know, no matter how robust your processes are, all, most processes these days involve human beings. At some point, they involve equipment that comes out of alignment, yeah, gets, has you know, as variability in how it performs. You guys so, have any opportunity to sort of get involved with any of sort of the, you know, laser inspection equipment that can sort of automate and get tighter on? Yeah, I mean, we do have laser inspection. So we, we use coordinate measuring machines. So we either contact or with non-contact laser heads um, for, for generating point cloud data on surfaces. We use structured light. Um, we use a system by Atos called uh, Blue Light, which again lays through, through photogrammetry, uh, through high resolution photography, will lay a point cloud on a surface and then we can extract that point cloud essentially in CAD and slice it and dice it sort of any way we want. Our customers have algorithms that we use for inspecting airfoils that are uh, relatively complex. So, um, yeah, and this is actually an interesting thing in aerospace because as our ability to inspect gets exceptionally like step changes in granularity mm, yeah. <laughs> over the last five years. Well, I mean, I, I don't know that people really fully appreciate what sort of point cloud is and all this stuff, but I'll just really yeah. briefly, like there's a lot of technology that's out there. And in fact, you know, I had a previous show we even talked about someone who can do what you can do on your iPhone now is pretty amazing in terms yeah. of generating point cloud data. But effectively, you essentially take a machine that uses light, lasers of light, or it could be a different light, and essentially uses, can read sort of based on that, almost like radar would, but, but you using light instead of sound waves can effectively in a computer down to, I don't know, the 1 billion, I don't, I don't know, the hundred thousandth of an inch. I don't know how deep they right. go, but essentially can look at exactly how the part is made and then compare that against say the digital uh, design that it was, that it was meant to be at, and then can tell you if you're on or off. So then you were saying as the complexity or ability to to inspect scales up, then that causes some challenges in manufacturing. It, yes. And challenges and designs that are 50 years old. So you suddenly realize that things that you know were designed 50 years ago, you, yeah, maybe maybe those aren't producible. <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know, maybe they're not. But yeah, the 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 technology for inspection is 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 really um, come a very long way. Um, Outpacing the technology to build, do you think? Um, no, the manufacturing technology is, has come a long way as well. Um, they're just, in any machining or manufacturing environment, there are a lot of plates spinning on tops of sticks, and all those plates need to stay on top of those sticks. If mm -hmm. any of those plates crash to the floor, you know, things, you know, the wheels come off the train. Yeah. So do. there's there are a lot of uh, inputs that are regularly being managed. Um, and, um, you know, at the end of the day, those inputs are managed by human beings. So there's a lot of uh, push for process control, you know, lean is great. Process control is great. Uh, you know, PFEMAs are wonderful, but process is not a substitution for capable human beings. Yeah. So you can't stick an idiot in front of a, a well thought out and well engineered process and hope that it's going to work out for you. Yeah. It's just not. It, it's yeah. So we spent a lot of time generating charts and and uh, and um, going through PFEMA exercises for our customers and. And while it, it, it does throw off benefit, I, I don't think it's a silver bullet. Some people feel it is. No, why not? Well, or where does the... You just can't, you can't avoid the fact that you need good people to manage all these processes. You, you know, there are just too many inputs, too many variables, especially when you're building exceptionally complex parts. You know, you're just, you're layering complexity on top of complexity on top of complexity. And decisions need to be made at certain points and you've got to rely on those decisions, how to use the tech and whatever else. Right. Yeah. 
So that was no that if where, then chart is going to. Yeah. <laughs> right. you know, it, and so is solve that, that. Is that where is experience, that where, experience, yeah. technical ability, you know, and and the whole time, you know, you're you're not just dealing with technical challenges in a small manufacturing operation. You're dealing with human beings. So you you have a family uh, organization uh, and and a family of employees who, um, um, you know, they give their days to you and they expect in return a livelihood right, right. and to be treated like a human being. You know, and and um, uh, you know, taking care of all these folks is is uh, is a huge challenge, and and the same people who are managing all those technical challenges need to be able to manage all those human challenges, all those HR challenges. You know, you can't just hire an HR person and expect that it's going to work out. No. If your manufacturing manager is a total jerk, you know, the HR manager is not going to be able to do it. You know, you know, well, we'll just fire him. Well, but this guy's incredibly technical. He's got thirty yeah. years of experience. You can't just fire him. Yeah, you know, yeah, it doesn't yeah. work that way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it. Uh, you know, it's it, it it keeps me awake. Yeah, well, I mean, so, so, so I got two two different things I want to pull on this thing, and we'll, we'll do one at a time. You know, how do you go from somebody who is so interested in in politics and in broadcasting and sort of that whole thing, which is, I, I mean, listen, I, I don't want to impugn politicians or anything, but I would say precision and nuance and detail is not really what politicians are usually known for. Yep. Um, and, and then you go to, so, so that's sort of your passion, something you've, you've done, you went down that road and then you sort of moved on to a, a different, you know, the manufacturing side, which is extremely precise, extremely technical. Yes. You need to balance the people thing in there, but it's, a, you know, it's some different sort of game. Um, just how do you, how does that work in your brain or how did that well, there is a common thread for me. Okay. And that common thread is... Momentum? Is, no, I'm just well, momentum <laughs> a little is... Bit. That's one word. <laughs> Remember these words, children. Momentum. There'll be a test. <laughs> Communication. So it, it's all... My interest and I think my particular skill set is in communicating. So I, I have, I think, an ability to digest uh, complex scenarios, figure out, you know, where... We need to go. What the question is uh, to ask. Don't get bogged down in the details. Um, so, in the same way, I was interested in trying to communicate. You know, I was on the media side, so I was on the press side. So, my interest was in communicating to folks what was going on in politics, what was going on in a race. You know, what's interesting about this race. You know, what do you need to know? Um, and in the same way. I'm um, communicating internally at Jarvis between, you know, managers, uh, setting priorities, uh, making sure manufacturing has information they need from quality, quality has information they need from manufacturing. And um, I'm the sales guy, basically. I mean, we have a, 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 a salesperson, but I'm the face of the company. So I'm uh, constantly interfacing with our customers to make sure that what they need uh, is uh, hopefully um, uh, being satisfied. <laughs> you know, hopefully they're being delighted by, <laughs> by Jarvis at, at some point. Yeah. You know, and that's what a salesperson does is, you know, you work half for your company and half for your customer. So you, you wear kind of two hats. Um, and, and again, to me, that's, that's, that's the common theme. So the skill set is ability to communicate and, and, and digest complexity and, and sort of figure out what's important uh, among, you know, with this constellation of information uh, and, uh, and act on it. Uh, and that's been, um, you know, certainly an important skill set for me over the last couple of years. Yeah, listen, so, I mean, you hit the nail on the head in terms of that communication is so critical. And do you, you started talking about, you know, how important people are and everything. And, you know, business is about relationships. People are about getting things done and keeping people informed, giving them what they need to know, not too much, not too little, finding that Goldilocks zone. Yep. It's not easy, but it's so important. Yeah, people want to, you know, people need to have certain pieces of information. And unfortunately, a lot of our customers, there's so many silos that are created yep. and, the, and, and there's no general management structure. I mean, we, there's so much redundancy in our, in our customers, so much overlap, and it's just wildly apparent that there's, you know, it's an enormous organization where there's not, you know, there's not the infrastructure for one person to kind of look at everything that's going mm -hmm. on, God's eye view, and say, yeah, 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 you guys are wasting your time. <laughs> You're like, this has already been done. Move forward here, move forward there. But we can do that at, at Jarvis, and you can do that at, at smaller organizations, um, and just kind of sit up above and watch everything and, and kind of push and poke and, and make sure. Do you do anything to 
augment or build those skills in yourself? Uh, I mean, I, not that I'm, you know, cognitive of, no, I mean, I, mean, I you know, I, I kind of feel like, no, no, I mean, I, <laughs> you got what you got. I, well, I, mean, yeah, it's, it's I, I got naturally. myself invited on your show. So that's, <laughs> that's, uh, it's like a master class in communication. So. Something's working. Something's yeah. working. No, I mean, I, you know, this is what I've always done. Um, you, you know, I, I think everybody's always communicating uh, in their home life and in their work life e everywhere. Yeah, you, you have to communicate. It's just sort of how well you do it. Yeah. You know, I mean, you, you, how often yeah. do you go back and sort of reevaluate, you know, an email that you sent out, a presentation that you did at the office? Like, how often do you go back and, and watch yourself or rethink about what happened and sort of do a, you know, what worked, what didn't work? What could I, you know, sort of do a, do sort oh, of like a I CI think, internal I, Kaizen thing on, on your own? I, I, I think regularly. I, I think you're learning what works best and what doesn't. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, f there are two types of managers, as far as I'm concerned. There's like soft power and hard power. You know? uh -huh. <laughs> like the people who yell and scream and, and browbeat you or bully you into doing something, uh, or the or the people that maybe use a little bit softer power um, and are trying to sort of talk you through something until the point where they need to use the stick. Yes. But, um, yeah, I mean, that's always been kind of a constant debate in, in my mind is is how much to browbeat people and how much to work with them, you know. So. Yeah. Well, listen, I, I just, the reason I brought that up is I think it's funny. A lot of people talk about, they struggle to communicate. They struggle to get in front of people. They don't know how to do it. And, you know, I asked you, do you do anything? Like, no, nah, I don't do anything to get better. But you know, that idea of just stopping after you do some of those comms and thinking, what did I do? How do I feel like I did? How could I do better? That little bit out of everything, just like, you know, tweaks that quality. A well, little you bit, know, little you bit. lose and your mind on a phone call. And then after the phone call is over, you, you say to yourself, well, that one horrible. <laughs> you know, I mean, there, there's yeah. my Kaizen event right there. Well, you'd be yeah. surprised how many people just blow past something and then, you know, never go back and think about it again. Yeah. A lot of people aren't very reflective. And, yeah. and I think a lot of people aren't super uh, empathetic. You know, I don't think they ever put themselves in someone else's shoes. Um, and, and I certainly try to maybe too much. Uh, occasionally, yeah. but I do think that there's value in that. Uh, I think people want to um, feel like they're being heard, you know, um, and that goes a very, very, very long way. Listen, if you're going to err on one side or the other, I'm, I'm personally and super aligned with you. I'd rather err a little bit too hard on the softer side yep. than on the on the harder side. I think the softer side you get a lot more bang for the buck. So you, yeah, you, you know. Can, you can you can fix those problems right. a lot easier than the ones you, know, you smashed. I mean, when you go and cross me for the fourth time, you're well, yeah, you're that's done. Right. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I, I don't think we have FCC. I think you can be fucked on the. I, okay. I think you can say right. that. Yeah, we're all right on I've, that. I've been told that I need to swear less. So I'm that's working a, no, that's all right. We, we're good. We're, yeah. You're in good company on that. So, uh, on just on the other side of the people thing, I wanted to ask you about is when you think about how important the people are in the process. Is that one of the reasons why workforce, having a developed workforce, investing in that workforce, not just at, at Jarvis, but in the broader sort of ecosystem, um, is so important to be competitive and successful as an industry? Yeah, it's, it's absolutely critical. And, and even with all the investment that I've seen around Connecticut, um, it's just not bridging the gap. I mean, it's, it's not even close. Um, there aren't machinists anymore in this country. You know, there aren't people who will come into a shop and can take a bridge port and make just about anything on a bridge port. You know, you, we have people who are machinists and they'll come in and push a button and they know a little bit about reading a set of dial calipers or, you know, um, but, uh, things have changed, you know, um, people's willingness or experience, uh, in doing things with their hands, uh, has, has just kind of gone away. Um, you know, I mean, my father, for example, had his head buried in an engine, you know, his, his whole childhood, he was always taking things apart and putting things together. You know, I, you know, I, I love, um, uh, mechanical challenges. I, I love to work with wood and, uh, you know, I, I love to make things myself. I don't have a lot of time to do that kind of thing, but I do like to actually make things. Uh, I don't think a lot of people do that anymore. You know, they, they sit on their phone and they scroll through their reels and they, uh, yeah, you know, hold on, hold on, hold on. I'm going to push back. Cause I, I, I actually think that, well, two, two things. Number one is I think every generation thinks generation one or two behind it is totally screwed. So there's probably a little bit of that going on. Um, I, accept, I accept that. Uh, yeah. Um, so a little bit of that going on, but, but I think the other component is, 
you know, we've created the situation, you know, that we're in because I, you know, we, once we got sort of shop classes and all that stuff out of, you know, the comprehensive high schools. And I mean, I, we're pretty close in age. I, I think, you know, I grew up in a time period where like the idea of going into manufacturing wasn't just sort of not encouraged. It was actively discouraged, yep. you know, and, and that there's no future in that. We're not doing that. We've moved past that. So, you know, we've created a place where we haven't fostered that those interests, but they're still out there. And I, and I mean, I, I, I sort of have, um, some benefit. Uh, I'm still young enough, or or just the way it's worked out in my family, where my mom, uh, who's you know, from this area, is the the oldest of, of four with a pretty broad spectrum. And so, my I've got cousins that are still, you know, quite young. You know, uh, yeah, still in high school. One, some in college, some recently out of college. And you know, you've seen some of them who are interested in 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 sort of taking things apart. You know, maybe tinkering with an old motorcycle or or whatever. And and there just has been nowhere to focus and harness that into sort of a, a productive way, but I think it's still out there. And if we, if we, you know, if we can find a way to find those people and help them harness it, I, I think we can, we can repower another generation of, of people that can do that kind of stuff. And then on the flip side of my statement, I mean, uh, most of the machines now lend themselves oh, to, well, you know, yeah, they pretty to, much to, run on to, an to, iPhone. The, to, to the digital generation. True. So uh, most of the work in, that used to be done on the floor to set up a job, it's now done in engineering to set up a job. Yeah, you know, so, so a lot of that process development is now done in engineering. Yeah, going back to the inspection equipment yeah. and model-based definition right. and all that stuff. It's just, you know, you, you want an engineer that's got some shop experience. You, you don't want a machinist that's, uh, you know, that's got a variety of things. You know, at the end of the day, honestly, if, if someone um, shows up on time is curious, mm. curious, curious, uh, and and has the sort of ability to throw up their hand if they don't understand something or don't aren't quite clear about the instructions, you know, we we, we can work with you. Yeah. So, um, but it's it's challenging to find that um, in people, especially the sort of curiosity and willingness to throw up a hand if they don't uh, if they don't get something. You, you finding any assistance like with I don't know a ACM or the regional sector partnerships or anything where where you can sort of make some connections. Yeah, I mean, I, I think a lot of the technical colleges and the technical high schools uh, have been great, and I think the state has really uh, supported uh, those organizations, and the ACM has obviously supported those organizations through um, uh, their um, workforce development uh, programs and and um, ventures. Um, it, it, there's just an enormous demand. Yeah. <laughs> you know? I mean, I think you... Even before COVID, you would talk to any manufacturer, and they would say that their largest headwind was manpower. Our third episode, yeah. which was three plus years ago, Jason Howie from OK Industries yep. says we've got three priorities: workforce, workforce, and workforce. Right. I mean, that was that was right. 2019 or right. whatever, right? And and so here we and are. Now it's and now yeah. it's you know, and now it's much worse, much more challenging to find people. I mean, we will have people who will accept a job on Friday and then be no show, no, no show, no, no call, call ghosting on yeah. on Monday. Yeah, I, I hear that. By the way, that's that's like across industries. It, that I don't get. I don't Listen, even understand that. And th this is where I must be in the wrong generation. I don't even get that at all. Like what what happened? Is that what quiet quitting is? Yeah, I don't, I don't even know what I, that is. I don't know what quiet quitting okay. is uh, either. But that just know. seems like totally irresponsible. Uh, and, and that's fine. We don't want you. Correct. You know, correct, we, correct. we want to have a team that wants to win. So, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, move along. But, you know, we're, we're just going to be a little what's grumpy that you waste, waste, the, wasted our time. What's the answer to uh, the workforce, Jason? How do we fix it? I, you know, I, I don't, I don't, I mean, it's, I, there's probably a couple uh, answers to it. Um, one, unfortunately, is rely less on human beings <laughs> in your process. Um, uh Two is just to maybe continue to do what you're doing and to publicize uh, manufacturing as a, a way of earning a livelihood. I mean, you can make over a hundred thousand dollars and and you know just have your GED <laughs> yeah. at Jarvis. You know, you can, but you're going to work. You know, you're going to work sixty hours a week, and you're going to be on this sort of rigid manufacturing clock where you get in at. 5.30 and you got a 10 minute break and then a half hour lunch and another 10 minute, you know, I mean, it is, it is a rigid environment, but it is by design because we have to make things. You know, if you're not sitting in front of your machine running that cycle, you, we don't get a part off. 
Right. So, um, well, every step relies on the step before it and the step after relies on you. So you've got to be synchronized like a symphony, right? Can't just... Right, right. You know, everything's got a tack time. We got a tack time that we build relative to our customer's demand signal, and, and we push that all the way there, back there to our process. An, and there's an irony I've sort of seen with the idea of more automation, right? Which is the more high-tech and more automated the process gets, the more high-skilled the people that we need are, the smaller the pool of people that we're drawing from, right? Does that so? There's a little bit of you know. I do find that there, are, you know, there are a lot of young engineers out there. Yeah, you, you know, I we have had less trouble finding really talented young engineers than we have uh, had trying to find inspectors, you know, manual layout inspectors or machinists. So, I, you know, I almost think that that's you know, that, that, that the manpower needs of the technology shift might be better supported uh, than the sort of legacy environment that we're existing in now. But, you know, automation is not a, a solution. These, these, mach these pieces of equipment are wildly complex. The uptimes are, you know, I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's just, you know, you talk about layering complexity. Now, <laughs> not only do you have a machine tool, but you got a little finick arm that's grabbing a part <laughs> and it's bringing it in. A certain, you know, I mean, you have, right. now you have a system um, and, you know, a lot of our customers are putting in these flow lines where you have a, you know, a finuk arm on a gantry that slides back <laughs> and forth between all these machine tools and it'll take a part out of here and put it in there and take a part out of there, you know, and, and they measure their uptime. You know, I mean, if they're doing well, maybe their uptime, I don't know, you know, they probably tell me different, but I, I think they are challenged by uptime. Yeah, well, then you had, someone's got to maintain that arm. You need a you know, mechanic to do this thing. Right, thing. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. you know, and, and maybe the... You know, the individual that's got to come and fix that machine is coming from Germany or the part, uh, you know, so there's there's a lot there's a lot to it. So some automation. What else we got for an answer? Some automation, some um, PR campaigns like, you know, like this show talking about how manufacturing is a, is, is a good opportunity. Yep. Um, maybe less of a push on college. It's the solution for every kid out there. I mean, it. You know, you look at the student debt in this country, and, you know, I just, I don't know that college is for everyone. You know, maybe it, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Um, but it seems to me that's kind of been the direction, like what we've been hammering away for. If you're going to push back on that, that's fine. I, I am not going to push. That, I don't I'm know that gonna, I have I'm, a lot of data I mean, to back I, this I up. I come around and embrace. Yeah. No, 100. percent I mean, I think it, and it goes back to, you know, what gets measured gets managed and and done. And and if every school system, the one of the key metrics is what percent of your students go to a four year college, yep. and what percent of those students graduate. That that's the push, right? And 100. percent And it's it's I'm I'm couldn't possibly agree with you more on right. that. Right. I mean, the only degreed individuals, the only degrees that I'll require would be for engineers and, and managers. You know, everybody else, as long as they can do the job and they're curious and, and interested and, and meet all those other metrics, okay. we're going to give you a shot, yeah. you know, because you're probably a scrappy little, yeah, you know, yeah. hustler and we want you. That's right. And that, <laughs> so, isn't that the best, right? right? Those scrappy little yeah. hustlers, that's what's going to get it done. Yeah. A hundred percent, you know, I mean, you look at the scrappiest senior managers at G and Pratt and Whitney, and they're not coming out of all these Ivy League schools, you know, they're, they're sort of made do themselves, had four jobs getting through a, you know, local community college and, and just have been hustling their ass off. And that's you know? what we want, right? And the hustles would get well, it done. You want people to drive, right? Well, you, you want people that want to win. So we have, we have some answers, yeah. right? So we got some hope yeah. for the future? Oh, of course. I always hope for the future. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they're, yeah, it's it's inevitable, right? And I do have children, so I, I don't want them to be miserable after <laughs> listening to this podcast, you know? Well, listen, I think we've faced uh, as, as an industry uh, and as an economy much harder challenges. So demand for what we want and products that do something really special, and now we've just got to find the people to build it. It's not, it's not that it's not a problem, but it's the kind of problem we want to have as opposed to... Yeah, it's a Cadillac the other problem. Way around. It's, yeah. it's, it's a good problem. It's, it's not a... Great Depression type problem. Exactly. Yep. So we'll we'll get there, and uh, we're 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 putting a little work into it just now today, publicizing. Jay, I'm gonna move us to a uh, rapid fire round of questions. Are you ready? Oh, uh, sure. All right. Red Sox or Yankees? Red Sox. Starbucks or Dunkin'? Starbucks. Staycation or exotic destination? Both. iPhone or Android? iPhone. Sports car or SUV? Both. Both. Uh, do you have a favorite business book? If you had to do something other than be president of Jarvis Airfoil, and it could be anything in the whole wide world, what would you do? 
Uh, I would write about saltwater fly fishing for a saltwater sportsman. That's a very specific and interesting answer. Are you good? Are you a fly fisherman? Yeah, I love to fish. Fantastic. If you could say something that you learned early in your life or early in your career that helped propel you to all the success that you've had, what would you say? <laughs> all the success I've had. I uh, catch more flies with honey than vinegar. I don't know. Oh, I like yeah. it. What's something that you learned later in your career or later in your life that if you could go back and tell young Jason and he'd listen to you, it would make a real positive impact on his life? Patience. Patience? What? Uh, just to uh, uh, not open your mouth immediately, uh, not act immediately, to digest, reflect, observe, especially in, in sort of important circumstances with important decisions. Uh, no one needs a, a, a quick decision. And if they think they do, they really don't, so you don't owe it to them. So take your time. Take a breath. Yeah, Get take a, a breath. Right? Take a breath. Take a lap. I love it. Jason, it has been so much fun uh, having you on the first professional broadcaster we've ever had uh, on the show. <laughs> it was it was really awesome. Great yep. conversation. Thank you so much. The pleasure was all mine. Made in America with Ari Santiago is brought to you by Compass MSP. Thanks for listening and spending some time with me today. My goal is to help build a strong manufacturing community, and it would be impossible to do without all of you.